Professor Len Coward uh, is uh, such a deep uh, thinking, thoughtful and considerate Noongar man. Uh, I've been fortunate to know Len for over a decade now. He's been a bit of a mentor, a cultural uh, leader and someone who I can call on for guidance and support as we go through this journey. Um, you can find the way how he shares these big concepts through stories is something that I just love. And, um, and he goes real deep and just someone in the community that, uh, you know, at the more the back end of his professional career, he goes a bit deep and personal around, you know, why are we here? Has my life been um, full of meaning or not? Do I know that I've uh, had an impact? Uh, we go real deep and down around, you know, purpose and things like that. So tune in, enjoy the yarn, and uh, see you on the other end. Okay, so we're here with Professor Leonard Collard, yeah. or Len Collard, or yeah. Len Legend. Yeah, Len. yeah. And there's probably lots of other names that we won't discuss. Yeah, we're, yeah, yeah, probably not appropriate for the camera. <laughs> Um, but Len, great to have you on board for the, yeah. the first iteration of Iron Yarn. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, no, uh, it's an exciting concept and I, as you always do, you keep me tuned in pretty well from the outset, what you're up to and what your aspirations and what you hope to uh, come up with next. Mm. And uh, one of the funny mm. things that was a bit of a catalyst for the motivation to do this whole podcast or interview mm. series that we're doing is when we we're at Northcott and you, we, you did that welcoming for mm. our first no event mm. for the IARN workshop. Mm. And you actually kind of deconstructed what IARN was and IARN yarn, and we're all mm. here having the yarn, the collective mm. yarn. Mm. And I thought that was really, and that kind of built mm. the fabric of the community is through mm. having yarns, and that's yeah. where IARN, and you actually articulate yeah. it way better than I can. <laughs> yeah, well, um, the word yarn is an interesting one, because obviously it can relate to a ball of wool or something, or a ball of something you might knit or pull together. Um, the, the yarn in Noongar is uh, like a, an in-depth um, dialogue. You know, someone says, oh, I need to have a yarn about something lucky that's really important I talk to you today. So you get the sense that, oh, that sounds like that's pretty important, I'd better go see what's going on. Or someone else might come and say, oh, hey, um, hey, lucky I need to have a yarn with you, mate. I heard you've been running around with my girlfriend. So that's another kind of attention. So it depends on the yarn. So, you know, I think, I think the idea was I yarn, which is I'm having an in-depth conversation, or we yarn, that is we both have a conversation, or the collective have a conversation. And um, I yarn, you yarn, and we yarn. Yeah. I yarn, I yarn, you yarn, or we yarn. Yeah, so it, it tries to cover the landscape of the possibilities of yarn. All of the different yarns. <laughs> yeah. You can't, I think, it, you can't have a yarn unless mm. I yarn and you're mm. connecting in with yourself. Mm. I think that's mm. kind of where mm. we've gone with I yarn, is mm. that you can only go deep with one mm. other mm. if you go mm. deep with yourself and yeah. you're actually truly mm. honest with yeah. yourself. Yeah, well, um, I, well, I think from what I can see of the network, it is about I yarn and then we have a yarn and, and then, you know, you have a yarn. So, it, it, I mean, I... I'd like to think that it's like it expands out, you know, it's, it's the old classic chuck a rock in the middle of the pond and it goes out. So anyway, that's just my spin on it. Yeah, my, like it. my yarn. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we've been asking a few people to like uh, quotes at the beginning of these kind of podcasts. Mm. Is there one kind of quote that kind of stands mm. out for you? Yeah, I think, um, you know, like, um, you, you know, the concept of, of uh, you know, people when they work and they have aspiration to achieve something. They might say, oh, you know, I'm, I want to be, um, you know, um, the, the idea of achieving, uh, how do you put it? When you, you know, you want to be um, better. So um, how can I describe this? Uh, you know, when people go for credibility, mm -hmm. you know, lucky, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I want to get some credibility, you know, I want, to, want people to make people to say, you know, about me that I'm, I'm a creditable person. Yeah. And so people try to achieve credibility. But I say, well, this, this year in 220, we're going to go for incredibility because we want people to say, you know, Lenny and Lockie, they're incredible guys. We don't want people to say that they're discreditable guys. We want them to say that they're incredible, incredible guys. I like that. Yeah. So you move away from trying to achieve credibility to achieving incredibility. You're incredible. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. It's deep. 
you kind of, um, you know, all of these accolades and mm. you're going to be a credible person mm. in certain industry, mm. a thought leader to mm. be credible, to be able to have a, uh, to, a, something to say mm. in a certain mm. subject matter. But actually being on, honourable and honest to yourself and say, actually, I'm credible. I don't mm. need to mm. put my CV mm. here. Mm. I have, I'm a person, mm. I live in my community mm. and I'm incredible. You can't really put a price about it on me. Yeah, it, it's a, yeah it, is, it is a tricky one. Um, you know, in the world of uh, business, I suppose, or even social networks, I mean, um, you know, everybody's got to have a card these days or a web, web phone or, a, or some sort of a social media communication. And for a long time, I, I didn't really do that. I just thought, oh, I'll just put along on my, own, on my own credibility. And uh, yeah, I didn't eventually think, oh, yeah, I do need a website, I need a card or something. But... You know, um, what, you, what you want really is for people to say, you know, when they say Lockie or they say Lenny or Mary or Joan or, you know, Lisa, you want people to say, oh, they're incredible people. You know, you, you, we need to move past, I'm trying to get credibility around here because, you know, to me that's a, a stage in the process. But the, but the end, well, not necessarily the end, but one of the end results to the next end to the next end is you want to be shooting for incredibility, I think. Mm, I love um, that. Thank you. That could mm. be... A word. One of my uh, mentors kind of says that the, at the beginning of the year, he gets all his family together and they go around the table and they say, all right, rather than telling us what your big uh, aspirations are this year, what you want to do, you want to lose weight, or whatever it is, what is your one word mm. that's going to guide you? Mm. And so, you know, how do you kind of bring that into your mm. mantra throughout mm. the year, you know, and how does that kind of, how do you, and that's going to influence your actions. Mm. That's a really cool one. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Um, so, Len, you know, we met... <coughs> Excuse me. So we met uh, back in 2000 and, uh, 2008 or nine, um, and I, when I was at Uni University of Western Australia, mm -hmm. um, we had a bit of a yarn. We heard about I heard about the Wadandi Festival, mm -hmm. um, the the surf comp, yep. the Indigenous surf comp. The the you oh, yeah, it had a couple of different names, but I think the last one was kind of the the yeah. Wadan Surf Classic or the Indigenous. Oh, the water Something, Yeah, I can't remember what the name was, but. Yeah. Yeah, it was something like that. Mm. And then I told you, oh, yeah, and I thought, oh, who's it? Where's the Lunga surfer? I didn't mm. really know too many. And we mm. had a yarn and we had a bit of a chat around mm. the IC Classic. Mm. And then um, you came on as patron for that, mm. as a big supporter of that. And that started off very mm. grassroots. Mm. We had about a, you know, it was just a couple of couches we got from the, surf, from mm. the corner of the mm. um, streets <laughs> and a couple of tents from the surf club. Mm. And we had 110 surfers that mm. first year. And it was huge because all surfers having a good time and yeah, had great yeah. prizes, and then it went on year and year. Mm. Been going mm. for over ten years now, mm. and you know we had up to fifteen thousand people there. Mm. And you were mm. just such a solid foundation for that, mm. um, you know. So that's where we mm. first met, mm. and I guess that's the relationship how mm. it evolved. And you know, it would be cool to kind of hear, um, and then you know, did that influence the, some of the work that these mm. you get? Like how many pe hundreds of people come through their school of Indigenous studies at UWA every year? Oh, I think we get in, enrolled in our programs. Um, I think there's probably a couple of thousand a year, possibly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's evolved a lot, hasn't it, over the last, mm. you know, initially it was just one or two courses. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, at the school before uh, 2012, because I, I went there 2012, 2014, something like that. Um, but yeah, th there's been some fantastic growth in our coursework. In, I mean, you, you were one of those people that come and patronise to check out what was going on and check out the yarns and whatnot. And since then, I think we've um, we really sort of um, have grown, grown significantly and beautifully. Course, you know, individual enrolments in courses have, have grown. Um, we hit a peak a couple of years ago, but um, you know, there's policy changes that either you can grow a product or it actually pulls you back a bit. But you know, we've been floating along pretty well, I think. Um, mm. We hit a peak, but obviously we've come off the top of that, um, primarily because of the, the way the, the uh, coursework um, options for students to enrol in things change and right. once upon a time there were less mm -hmm. so we had more and then of course when there was more then we obviously had a pullback because that's the same finite pool of students mm -hmm. um, but yeah yeah we're pretty happy we're, we're still in there having a go mate and you've done some on parallel to your teaching you've also yeah. done a few cool research initiatives and programs mm -hmm. and, uh, language yeah well um well, uh, I had an ARC 
uh, around... Um, ARC research. Uh, sorry, an Australian Research Council funded grant looking at Noongarpedia. And Noongarpedia was, was a sort of a, um, on, on um, you know, digital sort of on, on the net model of uh, intergenerational cultural transfer. And what we wanted to do was to have uh, a resource there using language as, as a pedia or as a knowledge for young Noongars and uh, not so young Noongars and, and you know, young people that live in the Noongar lands mm. to become more uh, conversant and cognizant of, of Noongar you know, language as, as, a, as, a, as a tool of education and communication. And so um, the Australian Research Council funded us, uh, who was us, uh, Professor Kim Scott, Professor John Hartley, Professor Noel Lucy, who passed away at the start, Ingrid Cumming, uh, my daughter Ingrid, she was over at Curtin, uh, Jenny Buchanan was my offsider. And yeah, so we, we, we've been putting away again uh, using the PDA system online to mm. embellish uh, people's understanding, contribution to and learning from the Noongar PDA. And I think the PDA is one of those really innovative tools. Uh, nationally, we're the only Aboriginal PDA on, 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 on the planet. Internationally, uh, as, as a so-called small language um, you know, endangered, you know, I think we're punching way above our weight. Yeah, wow. Mm. Well, and, and so what's the iteration of that moving forward? How's that evolving now? Yeah, it's, it's fun and long steady. Um, yeah, you know, there's lots of challenges because the, the idea of being uh, able to access a computer, to be cognitive to use it and, you know, have all the sort of KPIs against the skills to populate a page, it's, <laughs> it's not pretty straightforward and simple. So that was one of the big things we came across that mm. whilst in theory, oh, you can get online and we can do this, that and the other. Yeah, in no, practice, in practice, yeah, it's, you know, there's a lot of mentoring needed, but, um, you know, uh, uh, but it's, uh, you know, we get lots of people using it, but not necessarily contributing to it, which is if we had people contributing and stuff, that'd be great. Mm. So I think um, uh, one of the, the things recently, getting back to the SurfCon, uh, and this was my response to you, Lockie, when you came to me and said, Eileen, can we set up an Indigenous surf comp? I mean, I basically said, well, no. Um, I think if we're going to go forward, let's run a surf comp for young fellas and we'll invite the Aboriginal folk, like the rest of the folk, to the fore and we'll take it from there. Well, it just so happens that I went down and saw um, um, the, the TOs from the Wardan country, um, the Webb family, and uh, um, the, the, they basically now made the call back, well, we want to reinstate the... the um, the Southwest Aboriginal Surf Classic. So maybe we'll have to call you back on board to be a uh, one of the backups, behind the scenes type thing to yeah. do all the things that you know you've got to do when you're trying to run a surf comp. Oh, it's such and a great concept. Yeah, yeah, no, well, it was, it was fantastic um, when we did it years ago, but as, as time and tide comes and goes, you, 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 we, we basically let it go into abeyance for, you know, for a long period of time. And, you know, the Kuris, uh, particularly over east, and the Nungas and, and the Murrays, you know, they've been saying, come on, the, the Noongar Comp was, was a massive inspiration for us in the past and we want you guys to sort of get back on, on the board Remember again. you flew over, we got you over to the National Indigenous Surf Comp and you flew yeah, yeah. Mark Cole and all yeah, the guys. Yeah, Mor Morris Cole. And, Morris and, uh, yeah, Morris and there's a whole bunch of, uh, you know, Aboriginal and Islander surfers that got together and we, we sort of put together a bit of a business plan and we, so it's, it's all steady, steady. But I suppose when you think about it, Lockie, and this is where I need to put you on notice, that if they're going to give, um, you know, the, the footy crew... Uh, you know, $25 million to run sports, football-based sports education, uh, I think we'd better put a submission in to get $25 million for us to run a surfing academy. Yeah, right. Yeah. Because connecting to nature, the environment. Yeah, it's, 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 it's nature, it's a healthy lifestyle, it's, it's an international and global commodity and resource for people to engage in. Mm. You know, Aussie Rules is a fantastic national sport of ours, mm. and we all love it, you know, to the end of the earth, but... Uh, surfing is takes you to the end of the earth um, on on your board, mate. So you know, we already know that you know once we set up a game, you know, we can be inviting Aboriginal peoples from around the world, uh, be it Irish surfers or you know sort of English ones or ones from you know Pakistan or ones from you know Hawaii. I mean Maoris and you know, Indonesia. There's Aboriginal folk all around the globe that mm. you know we just got to make the call and set it up and make it happen. Let's do it. Mm. Make it happen. Kill. <laughs> all right, deadly. So, um, you know, and I guess there's a lot of other things that we've spoken about over the years, mm. like a lot of the, um, 
the work that you do in uh, with like this healing, this healing mm. work for young, mm. like there are a lot of young Noongars, mm. young Australians mm. who are getting a bit, you know, lost mm. to their identity. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's a bit of a challenge and I know you have the fathering projects and things you've been yeah. involved with on the, on the side. And yeah, well, the, the, thanks for reminding me about the fathering one, um, but, uh, you know, Kwok Marmon, good men, uh, again, was a response to the challenges around fathering in modern Australia, and be it Wadil Fallas or Noongars or any Aboriginal group, it's really tough. And Aboriginal men and men per se are getting flogged from one side of the you know, boxing ring to the other you know, with three people with a baseball bat. And the challenge that we have as men, who's standing up for men and saying, hang on, hang on, you know, we're, not all, we're not all child molesters, we're not all wife bashers and we're not all bullies and aggressive, you know, testosterone driven bloody maniacs. There's actually good men out there. And if we only talk about the bad guys, well, the good guys will never get to be heard of and then we will just be subsumed into the stereotypes globally about men. You know, so that's why we did the Quat Marmon one, mm. Q-U-O-P-M-A-A-M-A-N. If you Google it, Lockie, you can check it out. Um, but, you know, the thing about my uh, arguments with that one was, was it's about the cultural um, currency that people want to use. They want to look at the old ancient indigenous knowledge systems and work out, well, how does that, you know, carry us forward? If it carried our people forward for the last millennia, well, surely there's got to be good aspects of it that we can draw from to motivate and inspire and carry, carry forward, you know, in, in that uh, role as a father and a, as a brother and an uncle and a, and a grandfather and, and a, you know, whatever. Um, but, you know, getting back uh, to, to the positive attributes, what I find, Lockie, that in the world of, of, um, of uh, Aborigines and other Australians and globally, th there's a certain spin that gets yarned up and yarned and yarned, and it's sort of a negative yarn. So when, you, when we think about, you know, um, Aboriginal men or, or whatever, you, you tend to get this base, basic um, set of values around stereotypes. And the motivation to do positive discussion is, well, if we only keep talking about the negative stuff, how, how does it make you feel, Lockie? How do you feel when you keep talking and you're hearing colleagues and friends and loved ones continually talking about negative things? Oh, the sun's shining today. I'm, oh, you know, I'm really pissed off about that. Oh, you know, I went down to the beach and it was, you know, it was such a beautiful day, but I, you know, but I got pissed off because I, I wasn't there with my dog. You know, and, and then somehow or other, everything seemed to end up on the crap pile. And you're sort of saying, wow, uh, we've got to try and get back. You know, it's still a great day without the dog. It would have been great to have the dog there, but no, it's still a great day. Mm. And yeah, the sun was hot today, but hey, it's a great day. You know, and, and, and so what the underlying values was the work that I did was, I, I didn't want to uh, get involved in studying youth suicide. Um, there's plenty of bod bods that study youth suicide, but what I wanted to study and develop was what are the uh, steps and what's the, the process is for to get on, to build the capacity. Right. You know, everybody can harp on about, oh, you know, there's problems here, problems there, problems everywhere, but what's the resolutions? How do we change the mindset? How do we change the way of behavior? And how do we create capacity building um, means to, the, to a positive end? Mm. I mean, do you like talking to people that talk rubbish all day and negative things and blah, no. blah, blah? No. Or do you like, I mean, of course you need to listen to that and hear it, but you know, um, you also got to listen to, to the people that have vision and have aspiration and have um, ideas that hopefully will provide a yeah. plank yeah. for those ones that might not see the road forward. Like an actual holding hand journey to yeah. you know someone who is because this was this was working a little bit in parallel. Do you get yeah. some funding through some? It was like mental health promotion or suicide prevention. No, it's um, no. I mean, I, I have. I mean, I have got lots of funds over the years, but in the last few years, I haven't necessarily been. Um, uh, well, successful in raising funds, but I haven't really pushed it a lot. Mm. I think I just sort of, you know, I mean, I've had huge success locking around ARCs and other grants, mm. but part of the problem is, is that when you get a grant, well, you've got to milk it right to the end. It's like catching a wave, you know, you go from the outside, you go through all the sections and into the big barrel and you come out and you cut back and up the, off the whitewash and you keep going and you milk it right to the end. You know, I mean, what's use of catching the best wave and only going halfway and jumping off? And, and, in, and so the metaphor I'm saying is, is that all these projects that, that I've been so uh, generously funded to do, you, you've got to milk them all the way. Yeah. And if that means that well, you're going to miss out on applying for big grants for two or three years, it's because you're still drawing down right. you know, information and data from the things you've already done. If you've you you got a million dollar or five million or ten dollar 
$10 million grant tomorrow. And at the end of the year, you ran a go, well, surely the good is that, that should keep you floating along for another two or three years, surely? Yeah. Or do you just say, oh, I need another man, come give me another man. Oh, yeah. oh what do you do there? Oh, yeah, we've already finished that. It's, well, you're wasting energy on fundraising. You're wasting, yeah, you're wasting. And so, yeah. you know, so, um, yeah, I keep up with my teaching, I keep up with my research, I keep up with my publications, you know, um, and I keep up with my social media. And I'll keep up, you know, with my um, engagement around the things that I enjoy, like surfing. Really? Yeah. So here we've got um, the your I, I think this is a nice little segue into you personally mm. around how do you like? Obviously, you've got all these different aspects of your life, your university your research papers, mm. but then all the community work that mm. you do mm. as a senior Nunga man mm. leader, mm. Um, and and your family. Mm. So you know, this podcast is just a few different areas of it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's cool, it's cool the diversity of people mm. their wheels where they're at. Mm. So I like talking about the couple of strengths ones here, the family and sleep. Mm. So they're they're pretty they're pretty solid, eh? Mm. Yeah, I mean of course family's always super, super important. Um, in my uh, little family, my, me and my wife's family, uh, Lisa, um, Mia's the oldest, Mia Joy. Uh, she's up in Karatha. She got two um, granddaughters, Olivia and Emma, and her husband's Anthony. Um, the, uh, Ingrid and Tim, my second daughter, Tim's her husband and Hayley, May and Jennifer, uh, that's their little family. So as you can hear, uh, I've got four granddaughters and my wife and my two son-in-laws and then of course you've got your brothers and sisters, which there's ten, five brothers and five sisters. And um, yeah, it's like in any family, Lockie, there's good parts of the family, but of course not every families, you know, work in perfect, you know, sync and yeah, we've, we've got our our strengths in the family and we've also got our severe differences and you know that's that's okay to talk about that and you know what am I what am I alluding to is it my father was a, a paedophile he raped one of my daughters it caused a huge um, impact on the family and again the good men have got to stand up and unfortunately it gets to the stage in your life where you realize that the relationships with some members of your family they're never going to get sorted out that went so far and people showed little or no remorse about it and you're sort of saying, well, I too have to draw the line on this and unfortunately you've crossed the line and you've crossed it so badly, this is how I feel. Mm. If that means I have no engagement with some members of my family, that's life, mm. unfortunately. But, you know, we're not, I'm not here to patronise and say life's all fantastic and wonderful because life, you know, for, it's not always like that and we need to speak, you know, from the port or from the cob or from your belly or from your heart. And you know, I've got fantastic relationships with some of my sisters and brothers. Others, you know, it's horrible. And mm. I don't mind saying that uh, because that's the way it is. Yeah. Mm. Oh, mate. Well, it, I think a lot of this stuff that we do is about mm. this vulnerability to mm. be honest with yourself and, mm. and, and be honest with people you care about. Mm. And th that builds mm. get connection. Mm. Mm. So as I think on the family, on what do I got, have there? 7.8. Oh, OK. That's probably better than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> It's good with sleep, so okay. well, that's not quite a, you know, people are usually not too happy, satisfied with their sleep, so it's an eight. Yeah, no, well, well it's, it's like every your sleep patterns sort of go up and down, but um, at the moment, uh, I think the <laughs> pressure of students are all gone on holidays and you're sort of slowing up a bit, I think obviously the pressure is off a bit on that one, but um, so that does uh, generally sleep. speaking, I'm a pretty good sleeper, yeah. generally speaking. Yeah. I mean, there's sometimes when you're going through stress it probably is not as good as that and probably other times even better yeah and then so these ones here so you know we've spoken a few bit about the these ones the not as these ones here um health uh, five yeah my health probably i think i've got a little bit of sugar um that's come on in the last few years um but you've lost a heap, heap of weight well i think it's partly to do with maybe the sugar but i, I also you know realize you know you know there's certain things i can consume which are good and other things I can't. For example, I like to have a, a couple of beers, sometimes a couple t more than what I should have. But I, what I've realised is having a number and Coke, you know, all sugar bloody Coke's not good. Um, on the other hand, I do, every now and again, I might have a can of Coke or something because you know, I think we all like a sugar hit. Um, with uh, coffee and stuff, a few years ago, I was up in Lombok, up at Villa Collard, and my wife said, love, you've got to stop the sh milk because there's sugar in milk you've got to stop the sugar and maybe we need to have a look at just drinking black coffee so i had um triple five lima 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 which is an indonesian brew and poor oh, bob when i first had it, it <laughs> 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 you know i was thinking where, where's the sugar and uh, where's the milk because it was really bitter mm. 
Right. Um, but I stuck at it for a couple of weeks, and when I came back, uh, then I realised I'd, I'd kind of broken that, right. that dependence, and so when I got home, um, you know, we've got a coffee machine there, um, just put the beans in, and so I just have straight black coffee. So I think I'd like to drink coffee like a cowboy now, just a straight black brew, mate. <laughs> Well, that's it too. We've got your 60th birthday coming up. Yeah, mate, on uh, the 23rd, which is my wife Lisa's birthday. But yeah, 60, um, you know, you sort of, you, when you were a kid, you ever think about people that were 60, they were really old. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, my mum passed away, you know, when she was 57. So, you know, when you were 55, you're thinking, um, hopefully I'm not following mum's footsteps on that one. Yeah. And thank goodness, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'll be 60 on the 24th of December. Mm. And uh, yeah, I think I'm in pretty good health. Mm. But you know, you've got to watch it because um, you know, uh, continue to watch it. You just got to watch, you know, the the challenges around, you know, sitting on the couch all day and eating, you know, peanuts and lollies and chocolates, which is you know, we 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 do enjoy doing that sometimes. But it's not a thing you can do every day, all day, yep. you know, day and night type thing. Mm. And then you had growth here, that which is uh, that was at like that was more around six. So what do you kind of do for like growth? Oh, I didn't quite catch that. What? Six point eight. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's the? What was that about? Though the growth one? Yeah. So it's a good one. So growth is like, you know, are you investing in yourself and growing yourself? And do you feel like are you challenging and testing yourself and going into the unknown much, or do you feel maybe not so much? Or? Oh, I mean, I mean, at sixty, locker, you start sort of thinking about things, and you think, well, I mean, what are you doing? And keep working at university, talking to bloody students all day about things you've been spent literally more than half your life, or is there something else? To to do, I mean, it's a serious question that's on my plate right now, and I think about it. Do I, do I want to continue to invest in academy? I think the legacy that I've left is, you know, I think I've done more than my fair share of building resilience and building capacity mm. along at least a couple of things we talked about. Mm. And yeah, um, I think there's some good, strong young fellows coming through, um, you know, to take up that challenge. And maybe it's time for me to spend more time in Villa Collar and Lombok and spend more time, you know, just being and sort of worrying about oh, which lecture I've got coming up, what paper I've got to produce, what thing I need to submit, you know, mm. you know maybe, maybe I might get more involved in um, business and commerce and, you know. Cool. And then yeah. this, this year, contribution, there, 5.7 for contribution, like giving back to your community, mentoring, um, you know, like uh, for me, I feel like I can always call you up mm. <coughs> and have a yarn and talk mm. about run through things mm. and that's what... It's been so much for me to kind of, mm. as a wajira in this world, mm. living on Ungabuja, mm. you know, it's so powerful to have, you know, senior um, people such as yourself who've mm. got a lot of respect for the community to run by ideas and things mm. like that, getting out of these if you're yeah. transitioning, mm. freeing up your time. And, and I, think, I think that kind of feedback and, the, you know, like impact that you're talking about is, is one of the big challenges. You know, when I sort of sit down and think, well, how, how do I work out? whether I have had any impact on anybody and all the stuff I've done all, all this time. It's a real tricky question. How do you, you know, sort of uh, collect and pull together sort of data that um, kind of confirms <laughs> that what you've done has had any worth or any impact? I, I think it has, but I mean, how do mm. I prove it? Yeah. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's a real tricky one. Like, I mean, particularly when, when I think about, you know, the, the stats and data around, you know, Aboriginal young people and young people and, and men, you know, the tsunami of suicides and, you know, alcoholism and all those things that's going on. I mean, you know, has the work I've done had any impact in that sphere at all? Mm. I mean, I can't, I can't say for sure. Mm. I, I don't know. Um, ha on the language and cultural side, well, I think I've had an impact. But again, you know, if someone said, well, can you show us, you know, the data? Uh, I mean, if you spent all day looking at your data to try and figure out whether you're doing something right, it could probably nearly drive you nuts. Yeah. <laughs> you know, trying to in confirm your self-indulgence. I think it kind of then flips on with this whole data, like there's, mm. you know, two forms of data that are qualitative. Mm. So me saying, you know, for me, you've mm. actually had a direct impact on my confidence mm. and my personal wealth. Mm. And then that may have indirect impacts on the people I'm connected people. with. Mm. Um, but where's the data? That's qualitative. And this is one of the really interesting things with my motivation with Ion mm. is that I think some incredible, uh, incredible, like um, people incredible. who incredible <laughs> people in our community yeah. who give. It feels better when you say incredible. It is uh, incredible people in our yeah. community because it really it sounds diminishing when so oh, you know some some of the credible people I hang around with. It feels like you nose diving. 
incredible people I hang around with. Mm. Um, you know, exactly that. How do you know they're having impact? Like mm. yourself, like Ingrid, who I met with many years mm. ago, also it's a bodyboarder, mm. Eski Lida. Mm. And, um, you know, we had some great conversations. Mm. And, and like, how do you, you're creating a strong nucleus in your family mm. to grow? Mm. And then checking in on different things like this. Imagine if you started getting this data. Mm. Yeah, well, early uh, on yeah, and, and, and I mean, time. lucky, I think that's there. But, mm. I mean, you know, we're all busy. What, what, what am I supposed to do, run around sort of, chase all this stuff, I mean, how much time in the day have you got? And I mean, really, at the end, at the end of the day, um, you know, who's going to use it? Me. Yeah. To, to what? For what? Hopefully get credibility. credibility. <laughs> just, just do it. Just do it. Just be yeah. it. Well, mm, sound like it might be a, a honours or a master's or a PhD going to study to find out what's been going on. But, um, yeah, and I, I mean, you know, you do get really nice feedback. Um, you know, sort of qual qualitative commentary. I mean, I, I get it all the time. People send me unsolicited emails or communication. I've had, <laughs> I had one lady who was a student of mine. She was 18 years old when she came to Murdoch. And she was an immigrant girl. She was a Scottish woman that came to Australia as a part of that, you know, whatever was going on. And, you know, she, she said, oh, Len, I remember I went to your class. I was 18 years old. And this woman's a, a doctor now. Um, at, at university and blah blah blah, written books and all sorts of you know wonderful things, and um, she said you know that that the first paper I did was in a unit called Aboriginal Issues 181, and the first paper we got the students to critique and analyse as a political and social you know um, critique was Pauline Hanson's maiden speech. Now. You know, people say, well, why are we looking at Pauline Hanson in an Aboriginal Studies unit? Well, I just said, well, why not? Pauline's got plenty to say about a whole lot of things. So what we've got to do is get the students to read it and critique it and look for evidence, not, not to rouse on Pauline and say, you red-headed bloody so-and-so. No, I wasn't asking about what colour hair she had. I want you to read and critique her maiden speech to find out what was the, what was the values that she was presenting and what was the evidence to confirm the claims. Mm. And... <laughs> And this woman, um, even just a couple of weeks ago, emailed me and said, oh, Len, you know, that, that lecture and that unit changed my whole way of understanding the world. Mm. And, you know, I mean, you know, that's a, that's a piece of feedback which, you know, motivated that woman to go on to become, you know, do a PhD, publish books and blah, blah, blah. But here she is out of the blue sending something yeah. like that. And, I mean, it's not the only one. I, I remember yeah. another lady, a um, high-profile Noongar woman, um, uh, uh, language guress and all that sort of stuff. You know, she sent me a, an, an unsolicited comment. She said, Len, do you remember when I first come and saw you at Murdoch? And I was telling you about who I was, where I was from, and my, I was interested in language and blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah, yeah. And so you, you said to me that from the very first day, you know, get out there and learn it because you're going to need it, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, she, now she's ridden to the, you know, it's like she's, she's like the scum, mate, of, of Noongar world. And the reason why I use the word scum because I'm challenging the use of the notions. Scum is the equivalence to cream. And what does cream do, Lockie? Rises to the top. Exactly. That's okay. It's okay for someone to call you, you know, a piece of scum. Because scum always comes to the top. <laughs> I like that. Oh, man, I, I think we might end it there. I guess it kind of comes down to, like, you know, you get to this phase in your life mm. and I think you can... Mm. Or you, you know, I guess, what is the purpose? And why are we doing this? And mm. to get, you know, that you've had an impact, you've planted a seed in mm. someone's mind, which mm. is encourage them to go down and create a better world. Mm. You know, mm. and ask questions, innovate, mm. um, test, mm. and do that. And I think it's a real credit. And mm. you know, as a young up and comer, you know, young West Australian living on Noongar Budja, mm. um, you've really built me as a person to be more strong and resilient mm. as an individual and you played the mm. role and that's okay. Well don't worry mate, it's a two way street. And you know, what you give them and, and what you get is, is a mutually beneficial quid quo pro, so don't worry mate, you you provided plenty for me to chew on. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you down into that. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I'll see you soon. Deadly. <laughs>